The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 790 for Monday, November 25th, 2019. And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix them all together. The goal being that we each learn at least five new things. Today we've got, well, so we've got some great quick tips, including one we'll start with about uh, zooming a message in mail. We've got some good cool stuff found, including something I never thought could exist on iOS, being a Linux geek. But, you know, there's th- things happen. It's interesting. We'll see if it really can exist. Some keyboard questions and Mac stuff. It's all good. Sponsors for this episode include Linode.com slash MGG, iFixit.com slash MGG, Ancestry.com slash MGG, and MacSales.com. You don't have to use the MGG there. They just like that you know about them. We'll talk about all of them in a moment. Well, not all of them together. You know how we do it. We, we, we separate them out so that, uh, so that you know, it paces things and, and all of that good stuff. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, rainy Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, also rainy, this is John F. Braun. Hey, man. How you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Good. Good, good. Uh, my toys and devices, less so. But, you know, everything's broken. I well, I did a song about that. It's um. It sounds like a, a country song, maybe. Um, <laughs> we, we could we could write like the Mac Geek Gab country, you know, version where in, instead of our our like truck that that stopped working, it's our our MacBook or something, and we can include keyboards in there. Like, there's a song here. I feel like I feel like it. We gotta we gotta we gotta crowdsource this, John. We can Bob Dylan. There, Bob Dylan did a song called "Everything's Broken." Oh well, there you go. All right. Uh, I just heard your connection like flake for half a second. So I'm hoping that's all we get out of that. It's been so good for so many weeks since you got your cable modem, uh, line fixed. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, let me look at my connection info. Yeah. Numbers look good. All right. No good. Packet loss, uh, low, uh, yeah. Ping times are in the below 20. So, uh, okay. All right. Good. Looking good. Good. Hey, um, but it is a good time of year if you have to replace things because, you know, there's going to be sales and all sorts of good stuff. And if it's something you can use for your business, then, you know, you get that that last tax write off in to offset any 2019 income. It's all, you know, there's there's ways to justify these purchases of new toys. It's all good. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, But we have some tips that won't cost you anything. Listener Dave points out he says i often receive emails in mail app where the font is quite small it's not fun to read did i didn't know he says did you that you could just hit command plus on that email or command equals really works because you don't have to hit the shift to get the plus key problem solved says dave well that's true i i had no idea that you could do this and what's really cool is that that zoom is only is temporary It's only in effect for that viewing of that email. So if you move to a different message, it's not zoomed. If you move back to the original message that you zoomed, it's also not zoomed. So it it doesn't change any metadata or app wide viewing preferences. It's just that one thing like "Ah, I want want more. Boom, boom, boom. You know, great. You've got your uh, you've got your zoom right in there. I like that. That's man. See, this is the beauty of these quick tips, John. It's how much we learn. I think it's my favorite segment of the show. It used to be Cool Stuff Found was my favorite segment. And at times, you know why it's my favorite segment? Because it's the segment we're doing right now. That's kind of how I always feel about these things. Listener Allison sends in, uh, well, she had a question, but really what what she did accidentally was told us about a tip. In the last episode, we were talking about, um, preview options or previews in the finder, right? The show or hide previews in the list view in the finder. So you can see, uh, you know, different information about the file that you have selected. Well, what I had no idea about is that 
when you are there, you can go to the view option and or the view menu, sorry, and choose show preview options. And depending on the file type, you get different options that you can show. For example, uh, on an audio file, I have uh, all sorts of things like I can see the duration and the performers and the genre and the copyright and the audio channels and the sample rate and all of that good stuff. On a picture, I can choose to see dimensions, resolution, and then all kinds of EXIF data right there in the Finder preview. So you want to see your flash or your ISO speed or whatever. All of that stuff is viewable. If you're on a movie, you can get things like location, color profile, codecs, audio channels, sample rates, encoding format, you know, all of that stuff. It's really, really cool. Uh, I had no idea that any of these things existed. So in the view menu, go to show preview options. I think, am I getting that right? View menu, show preview options. It's right below show view options on, on both my Mojave and Catalina machines. So it's been there for a while. Hey, look at that. I know. And, and you can go and set them for different f types of files. So you can, you got to kind of revisit this a few times. It's fun. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about it, Mr. Braun. I don't know how oh, you wait, feel. Mine is grayed out. Are you not oh. in the list view? No, I'm in the oh. list view. Oh, because you don't have your preview showing. You got to go to the view menu and first choose show preview. Then you can show preview options. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Good question. Yeah. 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 It's pretty good. I, there's, I, I, you know, it's one of those things pretty stoked about in the finder. So. There good. we go. Show preview, show preview options. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Right. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Uh, I will link to this next one in the uh, in the show notes. In the last episode, we were talking about JP's question where he asked about um, various different ways to replace back to my Mac for controlling a remote computer. And we've got some more tips about that, too. But in, in terms of this quick tip, really... There's a link to it that he posted in the comments for or in the forum comments for the last um, for the last episode about using VNC over SSH. So being able to do this all with just the features that are on your Mac uh, and securely getting across the Internet to another um to you know to to one of your remote Macs, so it it involves some terminal stuff that I'm not going to bother to read you here because it would get very confusing for both of us. So, uh, and I both I mean like me and and you the one the one the one of you that's listening right. Uh, but I'll link to it and and you can find it in the show notes. You can get the show notes at macgeekgab.com while you're there. Sign up for our weekly email which takes the show notes and emails them to you so that you don't forget and the stuff is just right there in your box and you can, you can get to everything so good john very good very good cool uh one last tip uh i and related to the same thing listener robert says um Beware of screens connect the thing that I recommended in the last episode. He says a lot of people get caught by screens connect. Uh, I, I recommended it as the way to use uh, remote access on another Mac without having to mess with your router and, you know, forwarding ports. But as Robert points out, screens is a decent VNC based remote screen utility, but it has no secure support for use outside the sheltered enclave of your local LAN. The Screens Connect utility does a disservice to most users. It is not a secure way to connect from the internet. Uh, it is simply a thin veneer front end that hides the setup of port mapping, port mapping or opening ports to expose your VNC connection to the public internet. He says, at least the last time I checked a few hours ago, it only supports certain routers and requires UPnP to be enabled on your network to actually open the ports. So, 
uh, that he's right that that may not be the best option. So perhaps this thing that Christopher posted in the forums or uh, one of the others who mentioned would be a better solution. So now I have to look into that too because I thought Screens Connect was was great. But thank you for that, Robert. It's good to be informed. It's what we like here. Yeah, good, Mister Braun. I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Cool. Cool. Uh, let's go to John, listener John, uh, with a cool stuff found here. John says, like you all, I have and have had a number of external hard drives and SSDs. However, the new Samsung X5 just blew me away. It's a Thunderbolt 3 NVMe drive, and it is fast he says the best example i can give he says i do a lot of migrations using migration assistant i usually put the old machine in target disk mode and then use thunderbolt 3 or 2 or usb whatever's available usually i see speeds around 70 to 80 megabytes a second even among current line macbook pros etc i just migrated myself to a new macbook pro 16 yes he says i am that lucky using this new x5 drive which contained a clone of my old macbook pro I have 690 gigs of data. I expected a full afternoon of operation to get this done. Migration assistant reported that I was getting, are you ready for this, John? Mm -hmm. 1,010 megabytes a second, and the migration took 22 minutes and 31 seconds. In decades of working with Macs and PCs, he says, I have never migrated nearly 700 gigs of data in under 30 minutes, let alone using migration assistant, which is notoriously slow thought i would share well thank you john that makes uh justifying the cost of that drive it you know it's not super expensive but it's not cheap cheap right like a one terabyte is 399 a two terabyte 799 but it's because you're getting i mean you're paying for thunderbolt 3 for sure and then you're also paying for the nvme stuff so that's pretty good though like that, that those are good speed i gotta look in, i gotta get one of these i gotta that, that, that needs to be my clone drive because that's that's where it's at, man. You gotta have fast stuff. Really, that is the kind of thing that you want for your clone. And especially for those of you that want to boot from an external drive, like that's the key right there is uh is one of those so that you're you're really getting like those full full speeds. But the nice part with doing that with a clone is you wanna you want your clone these days to be on an SSD. If it's not when you have to boot from it, oh it's it's terribly, terribly slow because Mac OS really isn't built for straight up rotational drives anymore. So thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? No, that's, that's, uh, that's fast. It's, <laughs> it is fast. It's super fast. Uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, John, which is other world computing. You know, uh, They are the place we go to buy all sorts of things, including, you know, our SSDs and all that stuff. Well, this is the week of Black Friday, right? And then Cyber Monday is a week from the day this show gets released. So they have several tons of Black Friday deals now and several more tons coming, uh, including their Thunderbolt 3 dock, right? The OWC Thunderbolt 3 dock is $294.99 plus a free OWC travel dock when you purchase it. So that's pretty cool. So you get a twofer right there. The OWC Envoy Pro EX with USB SSD. Think about these prices compared to what we've been talking about on the show here, folks. Two terabytes is only $429.99. That's a savings of 70 bucks over their normal price. And if you need a new machine, or a, a replacement machine, I should say. A mid-2018 13-inch used MacBook Pro with the Retina display and touch bar starts at just $10.99. So these are killer prices. I always forget that OWC has used, you know, Macs. So you got to go check this out. MacSales.com for these and all your other deals and everything else you need. And our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right. Uh, Douglas, back to cool stuff found here or continuing with cool stuff found, I should say. Douglas says, um, 
this is more of a long term tip. Well, I don't know about this. I think it's pretty good. Pretty good. Cool stuff. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, his, his tip is that he says, I've been using my original AirPods for about two years and I'm quite happy with them. During my train commute, I often listen to podcasts. And since it's only voice, I usually listen with one ear, specifically the left ear. But as we all know, rechargeable batteries have a limited life. And since I'd been using the left AirPod more than the right one, that now drains much faster. Normally, he says both will charge up to about 92%, but only after one hour, the left one is down to 8%, while the right is still at 45 Therefore, he says, my tip is that if you want to use just one AirPod when listening to, say, voice content, I would recommend switching back and forth between left and right and balancing their use so that you balance their battery use. Uh, he says, better yet, and here's where the cool stuff found comes in, you can buy a cheap single earphone like the Go Novate for just $20 on Amazon, and he sent us a link for voice only. It lasts about five hours on one charge, he says, and I don't have to worry about losing it on a crowded train since I can just buy another one for 20 bucks. Uh, he says, I just bought the AirPods Pro and was hoping to keep the original AirPods as a backup, but with only one hour of playtime on the left AirPod, it looks like I got caught. Yeah, yeah. So I like this, this Go Novate. Having a cheap, you know, earbud to use for voice and things like that, when if that's if you're use if you're listening to podcasts a lot, for example, that might not be a bad way to go. So I like that. Thanks. We'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks for sending that along, Douglas. Pretty good, huh, John? Yeah, for the yeah. money. <laughs> yeah, for the money. You're right. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure you're not going to get, I haven't tested those. I'm sure you're not going to get like stellar studio quality out of them. But, um, you, you know, for 20 bucks, you're good to go. If you do want stellar studio quality on your in-ear, uh, your earbuds, I should call them, earphones, the new Anchor, or it, it's from Anchor, it's the Soundcore Liberty 2 Pro. I've been a big fan of actually a lot of the stuff that that Anchor has released under their Soundcore brand. Uh, and I recently just got a set of these Soundcore or uh, Liberty 2 Pros to test. They are one hundred and fifty bucks on Amazon. So totally, uh, you know, totally reasonable for what you're getting. There's two drivers in each earbud. And these are true wireless earbuds, which is fantastic. And it's actually it's not two drivers. It's one dynamic driver in each ear for the low end sound. So it's a real speaker that's actually delivering real sound and bass to your ear. And then they've got a crossover in there. And the high end sound is coming out of a balanced armature for the detail and articulation that a balanced armature can deliver. So you've got two different uh, drivers in your ear. One is a balanced armature. One is a true dynamic driver. And the sound out of these, even out of the box, blew me away. It was like, OK, this this is there's something serious going on here. And then they have a hearing test that you can do like it reminds me of when I go to the audiologist, you go, you launch the Soundcore app. It pairs with them because it's Bluetooth and then it plays uh, tones at varying frequencies and volume levels. And in the app, you hold down the, the, you know, the screen when you can hear it and you release the screen when you can't. You should be honest about this so that you get a good profile and it will profile your ears. I did it when I got home from a gig the other night, which may or may not have been the right time to do it. But uh they profile my ears perfectly. And then the sound was like, then it came alive. It's like, Oh, Holy crap. Like these things really blew me away for 150 bucks. And it, and they've got, um, they come in a, a, a case like all of them do now. Uh, you get up to eight hours of play time with these things, which is fantastic. They seal in your ear. They feel good. They come with different size tips so that you can really get it, uh, you know, get it settled out. And then you can tweak the EQ from where you from where it sets it if you like. Uh, eight hours of playtime per charge, and then the case gets you thirty two hours of playtime because it's got a, its own battery in it. And uh, the case itself is Qi wireless charging compatible, so you can put the case just on your Qi pad and charge the case up. So and it and it's a speakerphone or not a speakerphone, a, a ear you know phone headset too. So 150 bucks. These are like, I'm very impressed with these things. I've only been using them for, I don't know, a little under a week. Uh, so I, I can't speak to like 
you know, how I feel about them, say, a month from now. But I'm feeling pretty good about these. So um, I'm pretty stoked. Pretty good, huh, Mr. Braun? You know what? In that vein, I think I will talk about something that uh, I've okay. been uh, playing with. Yeah, go ahead. Since we're talking about earbuds. So, um, uh, Plantronics Backbeat Pro 5100. Okay. So they sent me some of these. And I'm like, no, oh, they're my first earbuds. Really? <laughs> sure. Your first true wireless earbuds, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, the, you know, yeah. Bluetooth and yeah, all yeah. that. Um, the setup process was really cool. So, you know, of course, you got to, you know, pair it. Yeah. Um, what I kind of like is uh, so when you uh, and they have a little case, you know, very similar, you know, the case has a battery and then you you put, you know, these guys in the case and it uh, charges them. I think you get about six hours. Uh, they claim about six hours uh, play time. OK. Of them. Um, it's kind of neat. So when you uh, when you start up, you put the right one in your ear and it says power on battery high phone connected. So you get some status there and you put the left one in it also says something it's power on battery high headset connected so you know it gives you a warm fuzzy that you know they're working right right um so yeah the app will show either the percentage or you know the amount of time and and they have an app that you uh install the phone um and the features are pretty good so you got to kind of learn their language so um so you can either touch or click a button to make certain things happen so uh for example the 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 left ear pod uh you know if you tap it the volume will go up if you touch and hold the volume will go down or instead of the left one doing volume you can actually have it uh do uh you can program it to make many different things happen if you tap either once or twice so um you can have it activate Siri. You can have it tell you the head, uh, the status of the headset. You can set a timer. You can have it tell you the time. There's a stopwatch. You can uh, set up a Spotify playlist, an Apple Music playlist, or I never heard of this service before, a Deezer playlist. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can program those actions for the left uh, one. Um, it supports something called HD voice, which you may or may not have, depending on your carrier. So it has support for, for that. Um, and it's also kind of smart. So, for example, if you're on a call, um, if you remove them from your ears, it's smart enough to realize you did that and it's going to mute the mic. Um, and it can also transfer the call to the phone from the AirPods if you uh, remove them. So that's kind of neat. Um, this is kind of interesting. Find my headset feature. So if you activate the find my headset feature, it'll actually uh, and they warn you of this, but it'll don't, actually don't blast. do it when you're in your ears. Right. Yeah. Right. They say, uh, yeah, this is really loud. So, uh, the, you know, don't leave them in your ears when it does that. But it helps you find them if you sure. lose them. So I think that's neat. And of course, you can play music and do phone calls and, and all that stuff. And there's noise canceling. Um, I see know, that. So yeah, they've got like noise and and specifically tuned for wind canceling so that um on the on the mics itself so that it it if you're in like a windy environment outside it will try and isolate your voice for the people that are hearing it so it, it's noise canceling on the microphone is there any sort of active noise cancellation on the i don't think there is there's no active noise cancellation on the on the speakers but but if it if they seal in your ear which these do yes then you don't i mean that's passive noise cancellation let's not Wait, in in the conversation about ear ear pods or earbuds in general, uh, people lose sight of the fact that if it seals in your ear, that's that's passive noise cancellation that that can that can really help. So, yeah, that's pretty good, yeah. man. Um, yeah. And oh, we have a question from the chat room, which you can uh, always go to at Mackeygab dot com slash stream. I think that's that correct. Is? Yeah. And Brian Monroe asked a question. Why would you get them versus AirPods? Or maybe he was asking you that. Um, I guess one argument here is that they're one sixty nine ninety nine, so they're a little less expensive. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I mean, so you, th this is a good question in general. Why would you get something like like these or the, you know, the anchor ones that we mentioned versus versus getting AirPods? And AirPods are way more expensive. Um, they don't necessarily like the, the, the anchor ones that I mentioned with the, the, you know, the manual. Well, they, 
the assisted tuning experience that you're not going to get with AirPods. Um, a comfort thing, perhaps, uh, you know, yeah. So there you go. Oh yeah. And they come with the, you know, same thing. They came with, you know, small, medium and large, but the, uh, but the seal with the ones that were, uh, that were on there initially was fine for me. So, uh, I haven't tested yeah. the new AirPods Pro yet. I, I very much like, so why get them versus regular AirPods? Because they seal, right? That's the big difference between regular AirPods and the two things that we've talked about here and also AirPods Pro, right? AirPods Pro truly seal in your ear. Uh, so they would be usable on an airplane. In fact, having wireless, true wireless earbuds on, on an airplane is fantastic. It really makes a huge difference. But, um, but, you know, original gen AirPods don't seal in your ear. So they're terrible on an airplane. They're great when walking around in a city, though. So, the, you know, different. I I would I I have uh, whenever I travel, I bring a set of AirPods with me because I use them as my speakerphone. And then I also bring a set of um, non Apple, you know, uh, whatever, something like the ones we've been talking about here that seal in my ear and, and really kind of close me off to the world. And either one of the, you know, that, that it's great to have both. So if you want that and you want it, Apple branded AirPods pro is the way to go. Right. And you get AirPods for when you want that kind of uh, open experience and AirPods pro when you don't transparency mode or whatever, any of these other manufacturers call it, not all earphones have that, I don't think either of the ones that we mentioned here today do, but say, you know, like the ear in M twos definitely have that transparency mode where it lets some sound in from the outside. Uh, it's okay. It's definitely, um, you know, better than nothing, but it's not what you're, it's not, it's not what I would want when walking around in a city. I actually want to hear the sound. I don't want to be relying on a microphone to try and orient me in time and space. So, um, uh, but, you know, yeah, no, there's I love my AirPods. They are they are the thing that I use constantly as my phone headset. And when again, walking around, you know, in a city or doing something like that, where I want to listen to music or a podcast or whatever, it's great. Yeah. 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 And another point brought up is, uh, yeah, uh, AirPods don't fit, uh, fit everybody's ears. I never liked. Well, I always hated the, you know, the round, you know, wired things that came with uh, the iPod. I, I never liked the fit of those at all. We have learned since the AirPods came out, though, even though they look the same as EarPods, with the lack of wire changes that dramatically for it, it is not. If you did not like EarPods, it means that does not inform whether or not you will like AirPods is, is really what we've what we found on that. Just so you know, John. It, it's right right because i hated those those two they always were kind of falling out of my ears and og airpods that don't seal they feel loose in your ear but i have not been able to get them to fall out even you know moving at 25 knots on the bow of a boat with the wind coming at me it just they they just stay right in they're totally happy so yeah 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 and i guess the other thing is would airpods work with a, a android device sure they're regular Bluetooth headphones, so uh, you can pair them. They've got a pairing button on the case, and it's easy enough. Yeah. So. Okay, but do you get all the the features? Well, what features? Oh, I, I'm I'm just wondering if the. Uh, well. Yeah. I don't I mean, know, but you can you can yeah. use. Okay. Yeah, they're just Bluetooth headphones. I, you know, Apple has done their best to do some pairing magic with them. Uh, and that's great. Like they they pair easier. Once you have them paired to one of your iOS devices, they you know, they they then paired the or once of your one of your Apple devices connected via iCloud. It that shares the MAC address so that your other devices know about it and they can do some smart handoff things in that. But in terms of them just being Bluetooth uh, earbuds, they're Bluetooth earbuds. You can use them with anything. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Because I think another reason you may want to look at alternatives. So, for example, they have an app with this one. And uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah, you mentioned the the ones that uh, you tried also have an app. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I guess AirPods don't have an app. They just do their thing, right? 
Well, it's built into iOS and Mac OS. Yes. But yes, there's no there's no separate app. But but certainly if, if you have AirPods, go into settings, Bluetooth, and then hit the little I next to your AirPods when they're connected. And you can control all sorts of things like what a tap does or what a double tap does and kind of how it all balances out. So, yeah, it's all right. OK, there. well, that was my question, though, is that that wouldn't translate to an android device right yeah probably you see not. what i'm see what i'm saying i do i do um i'm trying to think here there is uh there is an app called pod droid that someone has written <gasps> yeah that lets you control all this so i will put a link to that in the show notes pod droid for airpods on android there you go oh, there you go yeah nice yeah 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 and it looks like it's free so i'll have to try this with my my android phone that's pretty good that's pretty good you have an android phone of course oh yeah i always keep it it, an android phone like up and and running i these days i use the the duji s70 is generally the one that i'm i'm using as my android phone Uh, and i'll put a link to that in the show notes too but oh yeah it, well, it's I mean, I, I find it good to have the perspective of, you know, being able to kind of test these things and experience like like CarPlay, you know, uh, mm-hmm. versus Android uh, auto. And that was a short experiment because it was like, OK, Android auto kind of sucks compared to CarPlay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, but I always I and when I travel, I always have my my Duji phone with me. Ask me next time. If you want to mess with an Android phone, I always have one with me when I travel. So even when I like drive down to your place, I always keep one with me. So yes, yes, good. Uh, where are we on time here? We are in good shape. I like it. Um, I mentioned in the intro to the show, John, that I found something I never thought I would uh, be able to experience, and sure enough. I was I was actually on Leo's uh, Leo Laporte's Mac Break Weekly this week. And what that means is keeping an eye on his live stream uh, so that I know when Mac Break Weekly is about to start and then I can join the the thing and, and do the show. And he does. Oh, I can't even remember the name of the show, but it's a show about iOS that he does right before uh, Mac Break Weekly. And on it, they were talking about this app called Ish. I S H dot app is the URL where you can go find this thing. So I S H uh, it's hard, easy for me to say I S H dot app. And it is a Linux shell on iOS. So I quickly installed this on my phone and I've since installed it on my iPad. Uh, it runs the Alpine shell on your iPhone. It lives inside the sandbox like an app would right now. I don't think it's in the app store. You have to install it via test flight, but that's fine. It, like you can, you can, you can have that. If you started doing it, when I first started talking about this, you'd already have it installed. It's super easy. And then um, there's a package manager there. So you can use it APK and they even give instructions right when you launch the shell uh, that you can add the, uh, the package and, and you're good to go. And, you can do all kinds of cool things on it. One of the things you can do is run like ping or trace route from your iPhone to an external device. And I'd never been able to do that before. I did try running iPerf, John. It's not installed by default, but of course it's got a package manager. So I typed APK add iPerf three and it let me install iPerf, but I cannot connect to an iPerf server with it, nor can I run an iPerf server with it. So there's some something about the sandbox that limits that level of TCP IP connections inbound and outbound. I'll have to I'll have to mess with it and see if I can get that working, but I'll report it to him. So it, it really super handy, even just to run ping and trace route from your phone. Like these are diagnostics that I try and you that I wind up using all the time. And I always have to go to a Mac or I have to SSH like from using prompt or whatever from my phone into a Mac. Well, here I've got the shell local on my phone. You cannot, um, you can't drive around your iOS file system and do, uh, you know, anything like that because of course it's, you know, it's an app, so it's running inside its own sandbox. 
So you can run around its file system, but you can't go mess with other apps, nor should you be able to. But um, but super handy for diagnostics and stuff, especially network stuff. So I was pretty stoked to find that. Pretty good, huh, John? Yeah, and in that vein, yes, sir. it looks like the tool still works here. HE.net network tools. Okay. That's another handy one that I've had on iOS for a while. Mm. And uh, oh, yeah, it has iPerf and Mac browser, ping, ping, sweep, port scan, routing. Oh, look at that. Right. Cool. All ton of stuff. And for, for the record, that is available also on uh, on Android. So there you go. Yeah. Cool. Fun. Yeah. Hurricane Electric writes all these, all those HE.net tools. So. It's pretty good. Uh, One last kind of sort of cool stuff found. It'll help migrate us into the questions realm is that uh, listener Bruce wrote in and said in the last episode, you mentioned that you have a mechanism whereby your website's SSL is renewed prior to expiring. And this is super helpful with let's encrypt because they expire every 90 days, but they are free. Uh, and yeah, I use something called CertBot, uh, which is put out or at least hosted by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So CertBot.EFF.org is the engine that I use. And it it's uh, it's fantastic. It's super automated, really easy to interact with. I used to use a, a, a thing called Acme tool before CertBot existed. But when we migrated to our new server back in whatever it was, August, I guess um, I figured, well, I've got to rebuild it from the ground up anyway, no reason to go with Acme tool when cert bots exists now. And so now we use cert bot. It's great. Uh, I love it. It's, it makes all of this very, very easy. So uh, highly recommended. And if you have a, a Synology unit that you are like a disk station or a router that you are hosting any kind of services on, be it your, uh, you know, you could be hosting your website, but you could also be just be hosting, say, your Synology drive or cloud station or anything like that. Uh, I highly recommend getting your own certificate and they have Let's Encrypt uh, built into them and they use CertBot, but it, they have a nice graphical interface for it. So go check that out. It's pretty good stuff. You're using you're using certificates that you're that you're getting with Let's Encrypt for your Synology these days yet, yeah, John? Yes. When I set them up at one point it said hey you want to you want to put a cert on this and i'm like yeah sure yeah it's sure like, okay i'll get one for you yeah I'll, I'll go get one for you yeah exactly that's the that really is the beauty of of um uh, of all of that so yeah it's pretty good stuff man pretty good stuff all right mr braun i would love to talk about our next two sponsors if that's okay with you dandy all right you know, our genes aren't just about us, right? There's something that we share with the people closest to us. I'm not talking about the genes that you wear, although you might share those. I'm talking about our genetics, which you definitely share, right? And uncovering potential health issues early can help all of us with information. That's empowering. That way we and our families can move forward towards a healthier future. And that's where our sponsor, Ancestry Health from Ancestry, comes in because Ancestry Health helps us discover how our DNA might influence certain health conditions and the steps we can take with our healthcare providers to chart that healthier path forward. Every time I go to my doctor for my annual physical, you know, they ask a series of health questions and a bunch of those include what's going on with your family members. Well, imagine if you could add into that things that your family members don't know or haven't told you. Right. That's really important stuff to help chart that healthier path forward. And this is where Ancestry Health comes in. And of course, as part of Ancestry Health, you get that cool Ancestry DNA set of ethnicity results that reveal your origins, which is also kind of a cool thing. Now, listen. Ancestry Health includes laboratory tests developed and performed by an independent CLIA certified laboratory partner and with oversight from an independent clinician network of board certified physicians and genetic counselors. Ancestry Health is not currently available in New York, New Jersey or Rhode Island. Anywhere else? 
You can learn from your genes and take action for your family today. Go to Ancestry.com slash MGG to learn more and get your Ancestry Health Kit today. That's Ancestry.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Ancestry for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor for today is iFixit, where at iFixit.com slash MGG, you'll get a code that gives you $10 off of $50 when you visit the link. The code only works if you visit that ifixit.com slash MGG link. So go check it out. And the reason you want to go check this out is because iFixit is the place where John and I go any time we need to repair our Macs. Their toolkits are awesome. And without them, I don't think I would have been able to get through any repair. It's exactly the tools you need. It's not just like some generic tools. It's exactly what you need to get inside your Mac, your iPhone, your iPad, all of that stuff truly is the best electronics toolkit I've ever used because it's purpose built. And I fix it is, of course, where we go to check out all the repair videos, the how to videos so that we know how to get in there. And the tools are perfect because they match exactly what the people in the videos have. So, you know, you're using the right thing. You know, you're using the best thing. And they're going to have a bunch of things on sale here coming up for like Black Friday and throughout the holidays. So you've got to check it out. Make sure you go to ifixit.com slash MGG. And that'll give you that special coupon code right there in the page. Gives you $10 off of $50 right in that ifixit.com slash MGG link. You got to know their premium toolkits are the perfect gift for the techies on your gift list. So go there now. Ifixit.com slash MGG. You can be just like John and me. Our thanks to Ifixit for sponsoring this episode. Excellent. <clears throat> and Greg has... A question, which I think is a, a creative one. So here's Greg's story. I have an early 2015 MacBook Pro that is still serving my needs, thanks in part to my getting 16 gigs of RAM when I purchased it. Since I have an SD card slot, I've got an adapter that takes a micro SD card and remains flush with the side of the computer, and I keep a 256 gig card in it to match the 256 gigs of solid state storage in the machine. I currently run Carbon Copy Cloner every so often to back up to the SD card in addition to other backups that I maintain, such as Time Machine. I've wondered recently if I could or should set the OS up to treat the internal solid state and the SD card as a RAID 1, which is mirroring. Array as a method of automating this process. Is this possible? Is it desirable? Is it delightful? Do you lovely or delicious? <laughs> I like it. Uh, if I were to invest in a 512 gig card, could I partition it into a pair of 256 gig drives and then use a different RAID setup to achieve more usable storage with backup and redundancy? I think it's a good question. And, I think we have uh, the title for the show. Mm -hmm. Desirable, delightful, de lovely or delicious. I mean, there you go. Um, my opinion, Dave, is I, I'd give it a shot. Oh, okay. I, I had to keep myself from doing from from to, from what I'll, what I'll fondly call doing a John F. Braun, which is when you you mentioned the idea in reading the question. I wanted to go, but I didn't. But right. I wanted to. Uh, so explain why well, you think it's a good idea. And we'll we'll, we'll chat well, it out because maybe I'm wrong. Well, I have concerns, but um, you should be able to try it. Um, my only concern is that you may experience performance issues since the throughput of the uh, last I tried on my machine, the throughput of the SD card slot in the Mac last I checked, as well as the throughput of SD and micro SD cards are typically much less than that of the SSD. So. Yeah, um, well, well that, that that's my only concern. As far as can you do it? Uh, I think you can because in disutility they have something called the raid assistant. But they warn you. Okay? So you know, I'm 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 not 100% on this idea, but you know, the the caveats 
Um, in the RAID Assistant, they say this specifically, even if you have a mirrored RAID set, you still need to back up your data regularly. Mirroring protects you from some types of hardware failure, but not from user errors or software corruption. If you delete a file, it's deleted from the mirror. If software corrupts a file, it's also corrupted on the mirrored disk. So they warn you, if, if you're going to do mirroring, um, mirroring is not a backup solution. No, but it is fault tolerance. Like mirroring in and of itself is not my concern here. It It's mirroring to at a different medium right and mm -hmm. and it and I, like you, your your caveats are exactly why i am like like zero percent on doing this I, I think this is a terrible idea and the reason is okay that sd drive well i mean but i could be wrong right um that's the beauty of opinions is that sd card is going to run many many times slower than your yes. SSD will. And the what from what I know about RAID 0 or sorry RAID 1 aka mirroring and clearly it's not a lot if I almost confused it for RAID 0 uh is that when you write data the data needs to be written to both volumes simultaneously and the RAID only releases that when it's finished doing the writing, unless you've got some kind of write caching involved, in which case, you know, that that also creates its own like little problem scenario. So you'd be you would essentially be slowing your system down to run at the speed of an SD card, not your SSD. And it would probably be faster to go back 10 years and get a, you know, 5400 RPM hard drive and run your system off of that than it would be to run it off of an SD card. They're just super, super slow. Certainly there are, they have gotten faster and all of that, but in the grand scheme of things, they are, they are, it just pales in comparison. So, and I think your reads would also be balanced between the two, right? Writes are, are written to both when you're in mirroring and reads, I think are balanced between the two to give you better performance than you would get out of a single drive. But when one of those drives is dog slow compared to the other. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it would be an interesting thing to try, but I think mm -hmm. in the end you would be like, Oh, I hate this. So I like, is it dangerous? No. Is it going to be the kind of thing that you're going to, that's going to be worth like it. I, I always kind of look at this stuff as what would I advise someone to do if they were paying me, you know, some hourly rate to do this for them. And I if somebody said, could you set this up for me? I'd be like, yeah, but you're going to waste your money. Like we're going to have some fun together, but you're going to waste your money if you're doing it on your own. Uh, you know, if you want to test it out and let us know. Sure. But I think you're going to be I, I I think we already know the outcome of your time. Uh, but, you know, eh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing is that as far as partitioning to explore more raid types. Um, well, I just toyed around again with the raid assistant in this utility. And at least their implementation only recognizes drives and not partitions as a target. Oh yeah. I don't think you would, I, I don't even, yeah, part. Yeah, no, you would, you, you throw the rate is on drive rate is on the device level, not the partition level. Uh, yeah, I think so. To say here. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Cause raid is actually partitioning up your, your volume into chunks and sort of balancing things back and forth, not raid one, but, but other types of raid most definitely are striping it across devices and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I like this mental exercise. Don't get me wrong. I just don't, I just don't think it's a good idea in a practical sense. I think it's a great idea in a theoretical sense, but in a practical yeah, sense. Now, if you so. had a desktop machine and you had high speed ports, um, that I think the, the results of the experiment would be a lot more, uh, High speed ports. Pleasant. You mean like like Thunderbolt or or USB three or something like that? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It would. I mean, the idea of running a RAID spanned across different interfaces is sort of scary to me, um, because you you just create a scenario where one of your drives in the raid could fall offline without others falling offline right like if you've got you know say your internal ssd on you know whatever the sata bus or, or you know pcie bus and then you've got something on your thunderbolt bus and then something on your usb bus like that and then you raid them all together and say like okay cool now i have all the storage um i just feel like that might be a 
disastrous. But I don't know. But you could set it up in a way where you're leveraging all of these different data channels and not being limited to, you know, the the bottlenecks of any one. So maybe I don't know. I would back up a lot if I have. Uh, oh, yeah. If I had something like this, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But fun. I mean, I, I, like, I like talking about this stuff. <laughs> I just don't know if it's practical. But maybe that's maybe I need to maybe I need to loosen my um, my filters for the show about, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be practical. It can just be geeky fun. There's nothing wrong with that. So. All right. Uh, are we good on this one? I like this. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Okay. Uh, let's see. Listener David uh, asks, he says, uh, I'm having an issue with my uh, multi-device keyboard and some weird behavior with the command key. What I've figured out is, and his, 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 his device is a K780 multi-device keyboard. And I'm not actually sure what that is. I'm not sure why I didn't look it up when we <laughs> prepped the show. But in any event, uh, you know, we always take these things and try and zoom them out to give generic advice. Or not generic, but wide, more widespread advice anyway. He says, uh, I figured out two things. Number one, when the keyboard would connect via Bluetooth, the alt and command key uh, functioned as any Mac keyboard would. However, when using a unifying USB Logitech receiver, this behavior switches to the start alt and opt key, meaning that key now functions as the command key, not the one labeled command. I've sent this into Logitech and they have responded that this is the correct behavior, but it certainly seems like a bug to me. I've run into this with Logitech keyboards too. It's because they're generally built to be multi-platform, right? So they could work on windows or on the Mac. Um, but you can go in and change this on a per keyboard basis. So if you go into system preferences, go into keyboard, uh, then go into keyboard again on the keyboard preference pane. And then in the lower right hand corner, you'll find a button for modifier keys, dot, dot, dot. That means there's more. And when you click that, you can see what it's what modifier key is being used and what it's being mapped to. So you'll see caps lock, control, option, command and function. And they should all be out of the gate mapped to what they say is caps lock, control, option, command and function. In your scenario, you would map option to command and command to option to swap the interpretation of those two things to match what you are expecting them to be on your Mac. And I have to do this all the time with different Logitech keyboards. So that's uh, that that might be the simplest answer here. Thoughts on that, Mr. Brown? No, that's a. It's a handy yeah, thing. I didn't to know. know it's a, I didn't know it's expected behavior, but. Uh, well, it's expected in that it's happened with pretty much every Logitech keyboard I've tried, at least it, it if connected in a certain way that it, that it just sends through the command in a way that mac os interprets it as the opposite of what you would expect it to be so you just go in and change those two things and you're good to go at least that's what i've done so. yeah good mm -hmm. daniel has a topically similar question he writes um is there a way to change the undo command in the finder Basically, I don't want command Z to undo when I'm in the finder. I want to create a different key command. The reason being is that it's not always obvious when I'm in the finder. Sometimes I think I'm in a program window, so I end up undoing things in the finder and not realizing it sometimes. I Googled it and thought I found my answer, but when I tried it, it didn't work. And what he tried was oh so close. He tried... You go into uh, system preferences keyboard, uh, same place as the last question. Here, though, you'll go to shortcuts and you go to app shortcuts and you can add a shortcut for the finder. And he mapped undo to option shift command Z. The problem is that undo is already mapped in the finder to command Z. And so that takes over what you have to do. And really, the, this would be the best way to do it is go in and 
um, add an app shortcut to map command Z to something else in the finder that will remove it from the undo menu. So uh, one place you could map it to is about finder, right? You're not going to make any changes if it accidentally brings up the about finder window. You'll also know that the about about finder window came up and that'll be your cue to be like, oh, I didn't undo in my app. I undid in the finder, which brings this up. And this is actually a really smart thing to do. I've I think I've caused this problem many times and not even realized it by having the finder accidentally undo things when I thought I was in an app undoing them. So uh, I like that. That's a that's a that's a good little it's a good quandary. It's a good thing. And then once you have something else mapped to command Z, if you wanted, you know, for example, to have, you know, undo in the finder map to option shift command Z or something, you could then do that. And all of this is done in system preferences, keyboard shortcuts, app shortcuts is where that goes. So I will I will write that in system preferences, keyboard shortcuts, app shortcuts. That's where it's going to be. So that's now in the show notes, which, as I mentioned earlier, you can get to with um, if you if you go to MacGeekab.com, you just sign up and then they'll be delivered to your inbox, which is great. Hi, Mr. Braun. Got one for me? Yeah. Well, we got something from John. Okay. Which is a, a real head scratcher. Well, no, actually, I don't think it's a head scratcher. So John says, I have an app called Wi-Fi Signal that displayed, <laughs> I think that's the issue, the yep. signal strength and Wi-Fi speed installed on my iPhone XR. Recently, this app quit displaying these parameters. I tried to reinstall the app, but found it is no longer available in the App Store. I believe it stopped working after upgrading to iOS 13. Dot something. Since this app quit working, I tried using Wi-Fi meter and Wi-Fi status with the same results. All the apps displayed the message Wi-Fi, no connect, and signal strength, negative 1,000 dBm, which is probably not right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that means not getting data. Yes. Yeah. When I checked the Wi-Fi info on the Wi-Fi meter app, the network name and BSSI are unknown. However, all the other information on my network is displayed, such as local IP, public IP, etc. Next, I installed Wi-Fi status on my iPad Air. It is running iOS 12.4.3. The app works on iPad. The signal strength is 46 dBm and the speed is 210 megabits, megabits per second. I'm not sure what the issue is. I believe it may be a setting or an iOS 13 issue. Any suggestions? Uh... And yeah, I think uh, we mentioned the uh, source of the problem here a couple of times. As far as I can tell, Dave, it's a, it's a bug in iOS 13. Um, and I confirm this by, as you may or may not know, if you don't know, but there actually is a Wi-Fi scanner uh, that you can get from Apple. And it's the uh, airport utility. So you have to like do the uh, secret handshake here in order to activate it. And that you have to go to settings airport utility and then you'll see that there's a slider to enable wi-fi scanner and then when you run the utility you'll see uh an option in the upper right hand corner to do that so i'm like well let me let me see what that reports and uh yeah i saw pretty wacky stuff with that as well so it's wrong in in um, airport utility no but i um here's what i would see is that i would only see base stations that were in my um, settings network advanced preferred networks. Oh. So it would show like my main one, but uh, all the others, it would say, I don't know, like name unknown or something like that. It, it, it wouldn't fill in that data. Though it would show the MAC address and I think um, one other piece of information. No, you know, you're, you're seeing everything. That's your, because you've got a mesh system. There are all kinds of live networks without SSIDs attached to them that your Eero mesh will use to communicate amongst itself. So because I've got some networks here and I am able to see in, in the Apple app, I am able to see the RSI, RSSI and the channel and all that stuff for networks that I've never connected to. So I think I think your network name unavailable is just all of those mesh things that that are out there on the same channels and all that stuff. It, I think that's pretty normal. Mm, OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm seeing yeah. I'm seeing the same thing. And if you look at the 
if you match the channel number to the uh, MAC address, it's close. It, you know, it's like it's the same first five octets. And then the last one is like off by a digit that tells you it's the same device. It's just a different, uh, you know, a different radio. So, yeah, 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 that's all that is. That's all that is. So so okay. Apple's utility works. Nobody else's does. I wonder if it's an API change in iOS 13. And of course, it could be Apple using a private API in their app and no one else gets to do that. Um, but uh, it's possible that API that was public in iOS 12 has changed into something else that's public in iOS 13. Or it's possible that it's shut down and and that's the end of it. The only place you can see this is in Apple's airport utility. So, well, actually, um, he did write back, and uh, yeah, this is what I was fiddling with before the show because I wanted to find it. Um, yeah. He's like, oh, I found, but I did find an app called Speed Test, and the thing is, if you search for Speed Test in the App Store, you're going to see a lot of options here. Sure. So this isn't the, uh, what is it, Ookla speed test? Okay. It, it's another speed test that I actually, uh, yeah, let me. Uh, Which, uh, yeah, who's it from? Is it like speed uh, test master or something? No, no, no. You got to go down. It's a, uh, uh, I'll, I'll paste the link here. Okay, cool. All right. Um, but there is one thing called speed test and, and it seems to have been updated for uh, iOS 13. Okay. So it'll show uh, more parameters or got the parameters it. that you expect got it got it got it all right well that's good so it if that truly works in ios 13 then uh then you've got the one that th then we know that it it's theoretically a um it, an open api unless apple let it through by accident so this is speed test by Zhao Yan Huang, I think, is how I would pronounce that name. But uh, as John pointed out, the link is in the show notes to make life easier for all of us. So cool. Thanks. So it sounds like, uh, yeah, some people have to uh, update their stuff. Yeah. Well, and let's hope that it truly like th that this isn't a mistake, that the existence of this particular one isn't a mistake, because that would be sad. Um this has been a source of routine changes and lockdowns uh, in iOS over the years. So it's, it, it's possible that this is meant to actually go away. Hopefully not, but wouldn't surprise me if it was. So, Yeah. And thanks for that uh, tidbit on a uh, network name unavailable. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy yeah. to see if you launch like um, iStumbler or Wi-Fi Explorer, um, the latter of which is part of uh, Setup. You can sort by MAC address and start to see how these unnamed networks relate to your named networks. And it's just it's a, it's a nice, easy way to to see. Yeah, no, no, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I see my primary one has like four, eight. A five, and then I see a, un, uh, and then I see another one with the name unavailable four eight A four. Right, so, Exa okay. exactly. Yeah, it's just it. It's not. I, I don't think if I had if I hadn't seen it previously in Wi Fi Explorer, I I certainly wouldn't have noticed it in the Apple app because it's not organized in any in any way, let alone uh, maybe it's organized by signal strength or something, but it, it's moving around and it's confusing. So one of these apps on your Mac is way easier. I wish these apps could exist on, on iOS. I wish that these apps will continue to exist on Mac OS. And I'm hoping that things won't get locked down on the Mac like they have been on iOS because it's these types of things where it's really valuable to be able to just like have an app that talks directly to the network hardware uh, so that it, you can get this data out of it and you're not blocked from, from even seeing it. So let's, let's hope that that doesn't change anytime soon. We can also hope that you, when you need a server for your business or for your, even just for your home stuff, that you listen to what we're saying here and check out Linode at linode.com slash MGG. They're our next sponsor here. And these folks know how to do it because they understand what we were talking about just 10 minutes ago with regards to speeds versus 
different storage types. And they know that SSDs are the fastest. We know that too. Well, not only do they know it, they live it because every single one of their servers runs on an SSD. This is by far the biggest bottleneck when running servers is that you need your disks to be able to be accessed very quickly and it can hold you up. So everything that they do is on SSD. So you're not held up. And that means even if you've got something with a slower CPU, because you don't need the fast CPU, you still benefit from the speed of that SSD. And it makes a huge difference. Even on their lowest cost, $5 a month server, they call it their nanode over there at linode.com slash MGG. Five bucks a month, you can set up a server. I've, I've run like WordPress on it. I've run a VPN on it. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. Of course, if you have lots of traffic uh, to your server, then you might want to increase your CPU or RAM or things like that. But certainly you can start there, experiment, and you're good to go. And what's really cool is if you want to access the command line, sure, of course, they'll let you. But if you don't, they've got their cloud manager that lets you configure everything right inside a web browser. You never have to touch a command line at all. Go check it out. Go to linode.com slash MGG, and here's where it gets even better. You can have a $20 credit automatically added to your account just for being a, back, a Mac Keycap listener. Easy for me to say. MGG2019 is where you want to be. So go to linode.com slash MGG. Use promo code MGG2019. That gets you a $20 credit. That's four months for free of one of their Nanode servers. So go check it out right now. Linode.com slash MGG, promo code MGG2019. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's see what Brian has to say for us. Hey, John and Dave, this is Brian W. from Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, I was just wondering about uh, Catalina and printing and scanning software. It looks like any of the devices... Printers, multifunction printers, scanners, desktop scanners, all the software that used to come with these machines no longer works in Catalina. And it looks like we're forced to go back and use the image program by Apple. Are, are we moving back 20 years with this 64 bit and printer and Twain drivers? Because all the printers and scanners that I'm looking at and the ones that I have, none of the software works anymore. I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on it, and if you know of any of the software that these companies are going to produce that are going to make these scanners and printers work like they used to. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. Yeah, we've talked about this a little bit on the show here, and it, there certainly seems to be a consolidation of now incompatible 32-bit apps in the category of, I used to use this to manage my scanner. Uh, for sure. And and we can probably look back to, you know, someone that wrote some library or whatever at some point that everybody just sort of copied and, and used or licensed and used whatever uh, ongoing right up until today. And now no bueno. There is some good news, though. View scan V U E S C A N from Hamrick dot com. We'll put a link in the show notes. Has drivers that they have re-engineered to run in 64-bit on Catalina and other versions of Mac OS right there for you as part of ViewScan. They don't have everything, but they have most things. And they really have built the right stuff for you so you really can get exactly what you need without having to wait for your manufacturer to update. And to be fair, the manufacturers probably will never update if they haven't yet because why would they if you've got some, you know, five, maybe even 10 year old uh, scanner that works just fine? Well, they want you to buy a new one. So why would they they're working on their well, they yes, they want you to buy a new one, but also they're working on the software for their newer ones. They're not going back that far and updating that old software. At least that's not what we've seen from like HP and others. So uh, go check that out. Also, if you are using HP. There is an app called HP Smart that 
you might be able to use. And that is now 64 bit. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Thank you to Brian Monroe in our chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream, because it's possible you just need different software, not an update to the software that you have used in the past, but different software from your uh, scanner manufacturer, printer, MFC manufacturer. So yeah, be, uh, be on the lookout for that because there, it, it's there, there might well be an option for you. Uh, I will point out, I know we talked about this in a recent episode, but I am certainly in this boat. Uh, with my multifunction device that I have yet to replace because it works as a great laser printer uh, and also works as a great fax machine, which is weird that I had to use this week, but I had to fax something. I just can't scan to a Mac. I can scan to a windows machine and view scan does make a windows driver for it. Just not a Mac driver for it. So I could use it that way in a pinch if I needed to, but in iOS 13's files app on, uh, you know, on my iPhone, if I go to anywhere that I would want to save a file, so it could be in my iCloud drive, it could be on my Dropbox, but doing it from within the files app, getting to, you know, one of my favorite places to save something, pull down on the screen. And at the top, you will see sorted by probably by name. You can change all your sorting there. But on the left side of that little bar that appears when you pull down is three dots. Tap those three dots and one of the options that comes up is scan documents. What's awesome about this is that it truly does. The last time we talked about it, I didn't realize this. It truly does automatic scanning. You can set it to be color, black and white or grayscale. It will auto find the edges of a document. And when it finds it, if it's in auto mode, which you set in the upper right, it scans it. And then you flip the page and scan the next one and scan the next one and scan the next one. And then it saves it as a PDF to wherever you are in the files app. So it could be your iCloud drive. It could just be locally on your phone, could be your Dropbox, could be your Synology drive, whatever you've got that talks to the files app. You're good to go. So uh, that's been tiding me over uh, in the interim here. I'm sure at some point I will buy a new uh, MFC device, but I'll I'll burn through my toner first. So, uh, yeah, fun stuff. Good, Mr. Braun. Thoughts on this? No. Okay. All right. Well, then, we will uh, we will move onward here to to Steve. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's time to talk about Wi-Fi because Steve says, Dave and John, I need to wirelessly send a network signal to a building about 800 feet from my active network. I'm installing five power over ethernet cameras and a Wi-Fi hotspot in said building. Any suggestions for the hardware used to create a wireless bridge? Uh, the specs on the cameras, I assume, I assume are 400 megabits per second uh, with stand negative 35 degrees F. Wow. Power over ethernet signal strength indicators and uh, many to one. So yeah, this is interesting. Um, we love questions like this, though uh, neither of us has ever had to send a signal this far. Um, at the moment, my knowledge is all mostly theoretical uh, instead of practical. But I think something like the NanoBeam AC Gen 2 from Ubiquity would be the place that I would start on this. Uh, I, I think that's going to get you there. Uh, it is a, as they call it, a high performance Air Max AC bridge and is truly built to do beam performance across uh, Wi-Fi. The problem with most, I mean, it's not a problem. The way most Wi-Fi routers and access points are built is that they are omnidirectional, right? So they, they take their signal and they spread it in every direction. And that's great. In your house, that's pretty much what you want, Right. But Wi-Fi is capable of going much, much further if you focus it. And that's what this stuff starts to do when it focuses it into a beam. And it can really make a difference. Like you can go miles with Wi-Fi uh, if you're using the right hardware. So this is where I would start. But really, I would probably contact the the Unify or the amp, uh, Ubiquity folks and find uh, find what they would recommend for a scenario like this. But I, I'm pretty sure that's. That's certainly where I would start with it is those kinds of things. My my uncle did this 
on his own um, several years ago by buying some inexpensive dish antennas for like, you know, 20 bucks and plugging them into some equally inexpensive D-Link routers that had those removable antennas on them. And so he removed the antenna and instead into the what are they being? They're not BNC connectors. They're screw in connectors. But anyway, into the antenna connectors, he screwed these these dish antennas and aimed them and got them going. But he was only using, I think, 802.11 G on those. So his speeds were, you know, he was it maxed would have maxed out at 54 or half of 54. So, you know, 26, 27. Um, and I think he was able to actually real world throughput get maybe half of that. So if you did this with an 802.11 AC signal and got some antennas that were tuned for five gigahertz, you probably could get speeds. I don't know that you're going to get speeds um, of 400 megabits per second. That's a lot of bandwidth for Wi-Fi. I mean, your iPhone will barely do 400 megabits per second, and it's a two by two device. So I'm not sure how you'd get that kind of speed with a one by one device, you know, one antenna for each direction. But maybe some of these things that like, you know, Ubiquity has put together in their Unify line will uh, will do, will, will, you know, will bond multiple antennas together to get that kind of bandwidth across. But yeah, I mean, your iPhone is a an AC. I mean, it, not on Wi-Fi six, but on Wi-Fi five with AC is a two by two device, meaning it has two antennas in it. And the like on a really good day at the right distance from the access point, I've seen the iPhone like it hasn't certainly hasn't gotten to 500 megabits per second, but it, you know, it will tip the scales over 400. But that's like perfect scenario, uh, real world scenario. So, you know, could you get that with a, a focused beam antenna? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, but you. you, you You'll probably want some hardware that is truly tuned to this and not, you know, uh, MacGyvered together with duct tape and and, you know, dish antennas that you're buying kind of, you know, aftermarket. So I don't know. But anyway, it's it's a fun little thing. I think I think there's an answer for you. And I'll put a link to that, that um, nano beam AC in the uh, in the in the show notes so that you at least have a place to start. So any thoughts on that one, John? No, nah, not really. I think we talked about this before. I mean, dishes are nice. Yeah. As you pointed out, a dish is uh, something that can help focus. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. It's crazy. I like it, though. It's fun. Fun stuff. All right. Are we are we good on this one? Or do you have more more thoughts to to share? No, no, no. I think we're uh, I think we're good. OK. Uh, listener John, this will probably be the last one that we we get to today. Uh, listener John ran into a scenario that matched my experience exactly. So I'll, I'll explain John scenario scenario, but just so you have the, the kind of the foundation of it, I, you know, I was testing that 13 inch, uh, the kind of the lower cost MacBook pro from Apple. When it came time to send that back, I, uh, I wiped the drive on my MacBook air and, and wanted to clone back to it. But, the MacBook Pro was on Catalina and the MacBook Air that I got back from Apple after, after having its keyboard replaced was on Mojave. And so I needed to get that MacBook Air to Catalina uh, in order to, you know, in order to copy everything over or to clone, to migrate, a, to use migration assistant to get everything over. OK, so listener John went through a similar thing. Uh, he had a brand new MacBook Air that he was going to migrate a user to that was currently on an older 12 inch MacBook, which had been upgraded to Catalina. So for like, like me in order to migrate to the MacBook air out of the box, John says I needed to upgrade the new MacBook air to Catalina. Since I'm a believer in saving bandwidth and being fast, I have an external USB C SSD that I had put the latest Catalina installer 10.15.1 on. I created an admin account on the new MacBook Air and then rebooted into recovery mode in order to turn off secure boot and allow boot from external devices. Check. I then booted the external Catalina installer drive. Check. I went to install Catalina and it took the usual two to three minutes to copy some files from the external drive and then rebooted. And this is where the problems began. For the record, I ran into the same things, but John has 
has has detailed them so much better than I would. Uh, it says the reboot went into a piece of software called Boot Recovery Assistant with a message that says a software update is required to use this startup disk. Clicking update caused the system to try to perform an update and fail. I tried rebooting into Mojave and downloading the installer. And after 30 minutes of running the installer from within Mojave, I also received uh, an error occurred installing Mac OS. The request timed out. I tried this a few times and then contacted Apple who asked me to go to the app store and download Catalina instead of clicking the upgrade button in software update. This had not surprisingly the same result as downloading it in the previous step. I contacted Apple again, he says, and let them know of the error despite the alternate download path, which he says I didn't understand because going through the app store still uses software update to download Catalina, right? Uh, they didn't have another solution other than to offer me a return exchange, which he says they wouldn't cross ship. So I would be waiting another week. He says I opted for this. And in the meantime, while waiting for the RMA label to come through, I decided to do a little more Google Foo and experimenting on tangential issues. I found an article that talked about using Internet recovery and talking about the failures of the Internet connection, which he says got me to thinking about the T2 chip in these new MacBook Airs. I decided to test something, he says, and tried to use the external drive again. The first thing that he tried to upgrade uh, his own MacBook Pro to Catalina and got the same boot recovery assistant error. Since I returned my attention to the MacBook Air and with a glimmer of an idea booted from the external drive to upgrade and plugged in a Belkin USB-C to Ethernet adapter, which is recognized natively by macOS, so it doesn't need drivers. I still got the boot recovery assistant, but magically the update now worked and I was able to update the drive and then install Catalina. So by having it connected via Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi, it solved this problem. But the weird part is, what did it need over the network when the entire Catalina installer was there locally on this USB-C drive? And John's conjecture is, he says, I'm betting that the message from Boot Recovery Assistant referring to a quote-unquote drive that needed updating was actually talking about the T2 chip needing a firmware update to match the drive that he had booted from Catalina related firmware update to boot from this Catalina installer drive. Once there was an internet connection for the MacBook air to talk to Apple, to get the update, it worked. So I think he might be onto something here. Cause like I said, I ran into exactly this scenario. Now I did not solve it by putting an ethernet adapter on John. I solved it with, like, uh, well, bullheaded persistence, I like to call it. I just tried and tried and tried until it worked over Wi-Fi. Why it was failing so much over Wi-Fi didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know what it was trying to do. I figured it just needed something, which, of course, it did. And I just didn't know what the something was. But I think listener John is right about this. Um and I th and and I mean, I guess Ethernet is more reliable than Wi-Fi, but, my, you know, my Wi-Fi here at the house is pretty darn reliable. I, I'm not sure. I think there's something about the way the the boot recovery assistant or whatever it is is doing it that causes it to not really like fully use Wi-Fi in the right way or something along those lines. I don't know the I don't know I don't know the right technical term for this job. What do you think, man? Like this is a an interesting thing. Yeah, I don't know if I'd call it interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, but my guess is that listener John and I are not the last two people that will run into this problem. So, you know, yeah, Mr. yeah, Blunt. it'll be a big fun once I uh, upgrade my laptop. Oh, your lap. So your laptop is not on Catalina yet. Oh, no, it is. Oh, OK. OK. Oh, but you don't have this right. You don't have a T2 chip machine there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to see what this is like. Well, Lisa's Mac Mini that I have not updated to Catalina yet is a T2 chip device, but it um, but it's on it's connected via, well, both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. The Ethernet cable there got a little weird, so I just let them both run. And, and if, if at least if it falls off of Ethernet, she's got Wi-Fi and doesn't really notice that there's a problem. So which is good. Keeps things working. So. All right. Well. I think that uh, I think that does it for this week, my friend. I think, and uh, I think it does. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you for listening, everybody. And for those of you in the U.S. or anywhere that uh, are choosing to celebrate Thanksgiving this week, happy Thanksgiving. I think Canada was last week, if I'm not, I don't know. I might. Somebody in Canada had Black Friday misplaced in an email to me. So that made me think that maybe they were celebrating Thanksgiving last week. But um, Canadian Thanksgiving. I'll look it up. Uh, 2019. That is the year we're in, isn't it? Oh, no, that was back in October. Okay, I, I knew it was celebrated at a different time. Okay, so he just had the date wrong because he's in Canada and he didn't know when the U.S. Thanksgiving was. So happy belated Thanksgiving to uh, everybody in Canada and happy Thanksgiving to everybody here in the U.S. or uh, anywhere, like I said, if you're celebrating it. Thanks to, uh, truly, thanks to all of you. We we love what we do here. Thanks to you, John. I love doing this with you every week. It's a, it's a good thing, man. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, How can people reach us, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you tell them, Mr. Braun? Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's feedback at MacGeekGab.com. And that's what I said. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah. Uh, you can also, you can leave us a message if you want. In fact, we have, so, we, well, we had audio comments in this episode, and we've got some more coming up for the next one, too. 224-888-GEEK. Which, John, is 4335. That it is. That's where you can leave us a message, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to answer your questions. We, we really do. We love doing it all. It's, uh, it's a blast for us every week. We learn stuff. You learn stuff. Uh, it's really nice to kind of get lost in this every week, no matter what's going on. We, uh, you know, creating it, we're, we're just as into it as you folks are listening. It's, it really is a great thing. Uh, of course... Uh, thanks to all of our Mac Geek Gab premium supporters and thanks to our sponsors. Uh, sponsors for this episode, of course, were Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com, Ancestry.com slash MGG, iFixit.com slash MGG, Linode.com slash MGG. Other sponsors include SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Barebones.com, Eero.com slash MGG. Thanks, everybody. Just... Thanks for being you. John, you know, this Thanksgiving thing has me thinking um, about all of us, you know, thanking one another in harmony. And what a better way. uh, There's no better way to share our really kind of overarching advice than to do so in in harmony. So. I got caught. I played the wrong exit. <laughs>